I am going to discuss about how to find out the principal stress axis orientation from the fault data. The Andersonian model of faulting has been already explained and that idea will be important in this case also. We will refer it once a while. Imagine we will find out the principal stress axis which are I have already told you as sigma 1, sigma 2 and the sigma 3 axis from the conjugate pair of faults. Now what is the meaning of this word conjugate pair of faults? Conjugate fault means faults which are coeval faulting that has happened. That means the two fault planes, fault planes activated almost at the same geological time. Coeval faulting or simultaneous faulting that happened under the same stress regime. Since the two sets of faulting were happening together, the stress regime must be the same. And how to identify such conjugate faults? First point is that it is difficult if the two sets of faults are in isolation. What this means? Here is a set of fault almost parallel and few meters away maybe there is another set of fault and they are in isolation. That means they are not affecting the same rock body, they are not cross cutting each other. In such case, even if we call it a conjugate fault, finding out the stress axis sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3 may prove difficult. And by the way, how do I know that the two faults which are far away from each other were simultaneous? One idea is that if we date the fault gouge and if we find that the dates of these fault gouge over here related to these faults and those fault gouge related to those second set of fault have an overlapping time that means that the faulting has been simultaneous or coeval or they happen together. I am not going to discuss this right now. I am coming to this one where the conjugate faults can be identified if the rock body, same rock body is affected by them. What does that mean? Say this is my rock body and here I am getting one set of fault and also there is another set of fault. And what kind of relationship will be there if they are forming simultaneously? There will be inconsistent cross cutting relationship. Now we, we need to understand what is the meaning of this word inconsistent. Inconsistent cross cutting relationship. So for that I have drawn this diagram. Here this line represents fault 1 and its parallel lines over here is also fault 1 that is also fault 1. Since these three faults exposed over here, there and there are sub parallel as per my diagram. Therefore, I can call them as set 1, 1, 1 and 1. And I can also find another set over here which is shown by a listric fault which is certainly non parallel to the set 1. So therefore, I call it as set 2. So here we have got two sets of faults. Set 1 and set 2 are intersecting at an acute and an obtuse angle. They are not orthogonal. So this is a case of a conjugate faulting and faulting 1 and 2 might have happened simultaneously. One observation is that here fault 2 gets terminated across fault 1. So this is one relation. But what about here? What is happening? Here I see that fault 1 getting terminated across fault 2. So that is the meaning of the word inconsistent cross cutting relationship. I repeat fault 2 gets terminated at fault 1 that is one point and the secondly in the same exposure I am observing fault 1 is getting terminated at fault 2. So there is an inconsistency. Such inconsistent relationship will indicate that fault 1 and fault 2 were simultaneous or coeval. They happened together under the same stress regime. Now in this case how to find out how to find out sigma i that means sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3 i equal to 1, 2 and 3. 
the principal stress axis attitudes here once we say how to find out this we are not meaning the magnitudes here we mean the attitude of sigma i and attitude will mean essentially the plunge and the trend of sigma i the stress axis is a line so it has two components in its attitude plunge and trend now how to do from the field find out the strike dip and dip direction of fault plane 1 and the strike dip and dip direction of the fault plane 2. So I can write here step 1 is find out attitude of fault plane 1 and fault plane 2. If there are numerous exposures of fault plane 1 such as here 1 here and there I can take a statistically significant data information and that we are going to plot and I repeat what I mean by attitude here it will mean three things for the fault planes the strike the dip and the dip direction ok now after collecting this data from the field using either a clinometer or a Brunton, we will plot fault 1 as a great circle in the stereo net and fault 2 as another great circle in the stereo net. We are dealing with a case here, imagine fault 1 and fault 2 do not have the same strike line. In the case of Andersonian fault regime, faulting what did we discuss? be it conjugate normal fault, be it conjugate reverse fault, there the strike line of both the faults are the same. Whereas here I am considering that the strike of fault plane 1 and the strike of fault plane 2 suppose they are different. So it is a bit different scenario from our previous case. So as you can see for fault plane 1 this is the strike and for fault plane 2 this is the strike and clearly they do not match ok. So now in this case how do we find out the principal stress axis where the two grid circles intersect is a point which is marked as the intermediate principal stress axis sigma 2 and this is in one way similar to our Andersonian cases. What happened in case of Andersonian diagrams if you remember? If these are the conjugate fault planes where they intersect that means basically the strike line of both the faults these we marked as sigma 2. So here where the two great circles intersect likewise which is inside the stereo net here is the sigma 2. Now once sigma 2 is identified I have to think of a great circle whose pole is sigma 2. I can write here think of a great circle whose pole is sigma 2. So how to find out that? From here I have to move 90 degree inside. Ninety degree inside, and I get a point. And from here, if I move in the same direction, and this line, by the way, passing through the center of the stereo plot, stereogram. So here, this is the intersection. From here, I move ninety degree, and here also I move ninety degree. Then I have got three points basically by moving from here 90 degree on the periphery one point from here by moving 90 degree on the periphery I have got a second point and by moving 90 degree inside along a line passing through the center of the stereo net I get another point. These three points will be joined as a great circle. By moving the tracing sheet on the stereo net we can find a unique position where these three points fall in the same great circle and draw that great circle. This white dashed line indicates that great circle. 
So once it is drawn, I have fulfilled my requirement. Think of a great circle whose pole is sigma 2. This great circle represents a plane whose pole 90 degree if I move this way is sigma 2. Now once this has been drawn, now let me use another color chalk. Otherwise things get difficult to understand. Once this great circle has been found, I can find out the intersection between the fault plane and the white great circle and here also another intersection between the fault plane 1 and the great circle. Now I can find out this total angle and I have to bisect this angle. Once I bisect the angle by a point, then this point represents the sigma 3 principal stress axis. So what has happened? Sigma 3 is obtained now from sigma 3 and along this wide dash white great white dash line great circle that I drew and over which I have used a color chalk move this way 90 degree and move this way 90 degree and find out for which movement I get a point inside the studio plot. If I move here in this direction 90 degree the plot will not be coming but if I am moving in this direction 90 degree I do get a plot over here and I mark this as the sigma 1 stress axis. So what has happened? The angle between sigma 3 and sigma 1 has been 90 degree and in the process of this construction what has happened is that sigma 1 is perpendicular to sigma 2, sigma 2 is perpendicular to sigma 3, sigma 3 is perpendicular to sigma 1. This has been maintained. The principal stress axis are always perpendicular to each other in three dimension and that has been well maintained using the stereographic means. So in this case we find that none of the sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 lying at the center of the stereo plot, none of them also plot on the periphery which indicates that none of the principal stress axis is vertical and none of them are horizontal either which means this we have dealt with a non-Andersonian stress regime. And in turn we can say fault 1 and fault 2 as non-Andersonian fault. What is the difference between non-Andersonian fault and the Andersonian fault? In case of Andersonian fault, the intersection between the two conjugate fault planes will be horizontal if it is conjugate normal fault or conjugate reverse fault. And in case of a conjugate strike slip fault, the intersection between the two vertical strike slip fault planes will be a vertical line. So effectively the sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3 axis in case of Andersonian fault will either plot at the center of the stereo net or on its periphery and that has been violated here. So we call this faulting as non-Andersonian regime. So basically what we have seen if we go back to the title, we were finding out the principal stress axis orientation and not the magnitude remember is only the orientation and by orientation we meant the attitude that means the plunge and trend. How do we get the moment the sigma 1, 2 and 3 are plotted on the stereo net from the plot we can get back into plunge and trend. And here what have we dealt with conjugate pair of faults there are two possibilities in case the conjugate pair of faults are in isolation they are not cutting each other we did not work with it. We look at the second possibility where the rock body same rock body is affected by them showing inconsistent cross cutting relationship and which I explained here then I move to the studio net. So with this one part is over we are now going to see the second part. Just now we have seen how from the conjugate fault planes we can find out the principal stress axis orientation and we have dealt with a non-Andersonian stress regime where none of the sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3 were vertical neither any of them were horizontal. 
Now under the same broad topic estimation of principal stress axis orientation from the fault data, I am going to discuss about the right dihedra method. And as usual when I say the stress axis orientation, I only mean the attitude of the stress axis and here it will be an estimation. In the right dihedra method what is given? The attitude of individual faults are given. Here we are not dealing with two fault planes which are cutting each other or two non-parallel fault planes which are far away from each other. Not, that is not the case. Here is we are dealing with individual faults and we will try our level best to understand the stress axis orientations within, within the three dimension. Now, from this attitude of the individual faults, accurate plot of the stress axis is not possible. It is just not possible. And only in this case, the locus of the principal stress axis sigma i can be deciphered. To do this, we have to have the concept of the auxiliary plane. I will explain it first, then we will get into the actual problem. What is an auxiliary plane? First of all, such a concept is related to a fault plane. This plane is an imaginary plane. A fault plane is real. In the field, we can go and find rocks have slipped and can see the fault, can measure the strike deep, deep direction. We will not see the auxiliary plane, which is an imaginary plane and that is perpendicular to the fault plane and also is perpendicular to the lineations developed on the fault plane. What are these lineations? Imagine I am dragging a heavy almira on the floor. Now it may be possible that due to this dragging, the floor will develop scratches or lines. So those are the lineations as if when the foot wall and the hanging wall blocks are moving past each other or a vertical fall plane where the foot wall hanging wall is cannot be discriminated like that. In that case, it may be possible due to faults own movement, some lines or scratches will be produced on the fall plane. Those are known as the lineations. We can call them as the secondary lineations. This, they can be called as the striations. These lineations can be later filled up by secondary minerals such as quartz, calcite, zeolite, etc., giving rise to fiber-like geometry appearance. Now, in what is an auxiliary plane? It is an imaginary plane which is perpendicular to the fault plane and also perpendicular on to the lineation developed on the fault plane. Now the point is not all the time the lineation is developed on the fault plane. There are examples of fault planes which is smooth and I don't see any lines, any peaks, any grooves, no indication of in which direction the block has gone. Maybe only the fault plane is exposed and one faulted block is exposed, here the foot wall block is exposed and the hanging wall block is missing. In that case, when the lineation is not developed, this entire process will not work. We will not find the auxiliary plane. As we cannot find the auxiliary plane, stress axis orientations from the individual faults cannot be obtained in that case. So once I write this, do not think that always associated with the fault plane will be lineation. Sometimes it is there, sometimes it is not there. Now imagine it is present and how I can represent in a very elementary diagram. Imagine this is the foot wall block and there has been a deep slip faulting that has happened. So the lineations will be oriented in this way. If I put my hand on the fault plane and gently rub from this towards that direction and I feel this is a smooth direction, that will mean that the missing block which is the hanging wall block has gone down, in this case a deep slip normal faulting. Or on the other hand, if I move my hand from bottom towards top along the fault plane and I find this is a smoothening direction, that means the missing hanging wall block in the past has moved from bottom towards top, that means it is a reverse fault or a deep slip reverse fault. Similarly, strike slip and oblique slip faults can also be explained. Okay. So now I come to a diagram. Imagine this is a fault plane and this line is a lineation. Now what is an auxiliary plane? It is perpendicular to the fault plane and also perpendicular to the line. So I have drawn this parallelogram apparently to represent that this plane is the auxiliary plane of the given fault plane. So I hope this much is understood and now I am going to demonstrate how the auxiliary plane will be plotted stereographically. What kind of data do we have for this stereo net, stereographic plotting? 
we know the attitude of the fault plane and we know the attitude of the lineation. Attitude of the fault plane means I know the strike dip and dip direction and attitude of the lineation means I know lineations plunge and trend. Now with this data set this green great circle represents the fault plane which has been plotted. Strike dip and dip direction data were used and a plotting has been made. And from the attitude of the lineation we find let us say the lineation plots on this great circle at this point. Since the lineation is developed on the fault plane, so therefore strictly speaking always on the great circle that represent the fault plane somewhere on that great circle will be the plot of the lineation and that is why what that is what I have demonstrated here the point is here. The point can be here there or there depending on the real field situation. Suppose it is over here. Now what to do? First job is that from this green colored great circle that I have drawn for the fault plot its pole. And what is a pole? A pole is an imaginary line which is perpendicular to a given plane. So if this my hand represents a vertical plane then the pole is a horizontal line and if my hand now represents a horizontal plane the pole is a vertical line and there is one unique orientation of the plane and the pole so that the deep amount of the plane and the plunge of pole are the same that is 45 degree. If this plane is dipping in this direction at 45 degree then I can think of a pole which is plunging in opposite direction at 45 degree itself. So I have revived I hope you remember now what is the pole of a fault plane. How to plot it from this great circle. I have to move 90 degree inside and plot a point and this is my pole. The pole is plotted first. So why did I plot the pole? Let us try to understand. My aim is to plot say this is the fault plane. My aim is to plot or think about the auxiliary plane which is perpendicular to the fault plane. Now perpendicular to a fault plane or perpendicular to my hand will be a plane this hand on which the pole will lie. I repeat this is the fault plane, this is the pole and a plane which is perpendicular to the fault plane must contain the pole. So look at this hand this is containing or the pole is lying on the auxiliary plane. So what I mean is that the auxiliary plane must pass through that particular point. A line in three dimension will be plotted as a point and the auxiliary plane must pass through that point. That is why the pole is plotted. Now the next thing as per the definition of the auxiliary plane it is perpendicular to the lineation also. That means that plane will be perpendicular to this point which is basically line in three dimension. So now what do I do? This is the center of the stereo net. I can join this point and that point which comes over here. Now along this line I will move 90 degree inside and I will get a plot and this is not called pole. There is no name for this point this point has been plotted. But what I can tell you is that this point represents a line which is at 90 degree angle with the lineation on the fault plane. So now what do we have? We have got two plots. First is the pole which is plotted and then there is another point which is plotted. Now my job will be to join these points by a great circle which means that these two points on the tracing sheet those points are there. I rotate the tracing sheet maintaining the center of the stereo plot that I am doing on the tracing sheet to be coincident with the stereo net which is below the tracing sheet. In this kind of rotation at one unique position I will find a great circle can be conceived and that great circle will look like this passing through the pole and that particular point. So this 
great circle now represents the auxiliary plane and if we have understood up to this now we are going to take the problem ahead in constraining in finding the locus of the principal stress axis when a single fault plane data is considered and in fact one single set is considered and at another place another single set is considered and then we will see how to handle now that we have understood the auxiliary plane plot within the stereo net we are in a position to estimate the principal stress axis orientations consider fault 1 has been plotted this blue grid circle is the f means fault 1 and the auxiliary plane has also been plotted so in this plot i am not showing the lineation that is plotted on the fault plane how the from the lineation and from the fault plane the auxiliary plane ap can be plotted i have already shown so that is why i am not showing here the lineation plot but in reality to get into this auxiliary plane there has to be fault plane there has to be lineation from there the auxiliary plane can be drawn now once this is being drawn depending on the fault type we can put the sigma 1 and the sigma 3 principal stress axis possible regions i have shaded two regions and these are let's say depending on the fault this is the sigma 1 orientation so at any point in at any place at any point inside sigma 1 can be located or it can also be located there and there are two other regions a small one over here and the bigger one over here where in fact the center of the stereo net is also being there this is the location of the sigma 3 principal stress axis now we do the same thing for fault 2 for second fault we plot the fault plane and the auxiliary plane now this time i am not showing here which one is the fault plane which one is the auxiliary plane if one is fault plane the other is the auxiliary plane and then we can locate depending on the fault type this shaded region is let's say sigma 1 possible plot sigma 1 axis will be plotted somewhere here or it is over here and what is the possible position of the sigma 3 axis it will be anywhere inside this blank zone or inside within this blank zone now from fault 1 and the fault 2 data being plotted stereographically in this way we are going to comment where plausible location of the sigma 1 and the sigma 3 principal stress axis can be so what to do for that first i draw these two great circles over here and then these two great circles are drawn also in a new stereo plot now what is to be done we have to see from these two stereo plots what are the zones where sigma 1 is common in both the places by drawing the four great circles we have divided the stereo net stereo plot region into several subdomains like 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 and 10 how many of these subdomains have got the dash region the dash region common that will be the sigma 1 orientation the the bits where this white region blank region and these blank regions are there that will be the possible orientation of the sigma 3 axis and how to do this exercise we have to take one tracing sheet and get this done we have to take another tracing sheet and get it get this done then pick up these two tracing sheets and superpose maintaining the same center and then put a third tracing sheet over it and then keep on drawing these great circles and from the third tracing sheet from the top we can see which zones have got common shaded region that will be shaded on the third tracing sheet and the rest of the zones will be in blank so in this way we can narrow down the possible positions within the stereo net sigma 1 and sigma 3 or in other words the possible plunge and trend values of the sigma 1 and sigma 3 principal stress axis